Hi everyone, it's KJ. Back in 2016, I got into 14 different universities, including Harvard, MIT, and Princeton. And then I ultimately ended up attending MIT for my undergraduate degree and Stanford for a grad school program. Today, I'm gonna to be answering college admissions questions in my first ever episode of LifeSport. Venus Vloggers asks, what are the top three things someone has to do in order to get into MIT in your opinion? Number one, I think you need to find something that you're truly passionate about and that you can excel in. Whether it's robotics or math Olympiad, or it's something like pottery, music, or sports. You know, it doesn't have to be something that aligns with the specific major that you're trying to apply to, but make sure that you excel in it and that you're dedicated enough in it to do well and stand out. Number two, be near the top in terms of GPA and standardized test scores. Yes, it's not the biggest importance and I'll get into my stats and the importance of SATs later on in this video, but you need to make sure that you're in the ballpark. You don't want it to be the reason why someone doesn't even look at your application in the first place. Number three, be able to tell your own story so that you can present the value that you bring to the table. This applies to college admissions, but it also applies to the rest of your life. You need to be able to share your story so that people can understand where you're coming from and understand what you can bring to them because ultimately they're accepting you into the college because they expect you to bring value also. RG2067 asks, how high was your GPA when applying for masters at Stanford? So MIT does this weird thing where they grade their students on a five point scale. It's confusing at first, but really it's just subtracting one and you get to the normal scale. So ultimately when I ended up applying to Stanford, I had a 4.7 GPA. So what this would equate to is just a 3.7 anywhere else. Zara Fislam asks, what extracurricular activities did you pursue in your life? So I'll answer this question in different stages because throughout my life, my interests changed and the things that I pursued changed. So in high school, I pursued sports really heavily. I did three varsity sports, volleyball, track, and basketball. Basketball consumed a lot of my time both on and off that season. And during the summers, I also dabbled in different things to pursue some sort of engineering interest. So one summer, I did a game app development course at a local community college. And then another summer, I ended up conducting research at an electrical engineering lab at UCLA. In college, that shifted a little bit because I had this YouTube channel. So a lot of what I had time to do at MIT was just film these videos, write these videos, and do all the admin work around building a channel this size. So yeah, at MIT, I really was only able to keep up with basketball and YouTube and some weightlifting in between. Anglebreaker23 asks, what makes MIT different from other colleges and how can you include that in the Why Us essay? So for me, I think the the biggest differentiator is the hands-on approach to everything. So in aerospace, every aerospace engineer has to build a water propelled rocket and build a foam airplane from scratch, right? Every mechanical engineer has to go through this year long course that walks you through ideation to ultimately presenting in front of the entire school and investors. And there's just different hands-on parts of the curriculum that every student needs to go through. And I really appreciate that because I learn a lot by doing some other things that set it apart are that there's no class ranks. There's no valedictorian. There's no 10th person in any given class. Everyone just graduates together and you don't really know where you fall relatively. And the last thing that sets MIT apart is that the difficulty is inherently baked into the curriculum. So along with being hands-on, the professors also try to push the boundary of your knowledge, right? Every test, every project is probably going to push you out of your comfort zone and that's intentional. Everything is supposed to challenge you and you're not supposed to succeed in everything. Leah16 asks, how important are SAT scores? So they're not the most important thing in the world. Actually on an application, I think they might be the least important thing out of the major things like GPA, SAT scores, extracurriculars, and essays, for example. But what's important is that you have to get into the ballpark. So I say to anybody that asks this, this just to make sure to get into that middle 50th percentile. So between the 25th percentile and 75th percentile of all applicants for the previous year, just try to get into that range. If you can't find the specific stats for MIT, it's probably going to be similar to schools like Harvard or Stanford or Princeton or any other of the Ivy 
leagues. With schools that are this popular, it's really just all a numbers game. So just try to get a score that won't have reviewers not even consider your application. Lalit M15 asks, is it better to apply for a less competitive major than the one you want if extracurriculars line up with the major? Choosing a major is a very important decision and it <laughs> dictates what you're going to be learning over the next four or five years. So do not choose a major just because it's easier to get into. If there's one that interests you more, that aligns more with your passions, do that because ultimately that's what's going to motivate you and carry you through the difficult parts of the semesters. So even if you don't get into a specific program at a specific school, I'd recommend someone to go to a school that does have the things that they want to pursue because ultimately I think you'll be more successful in the long run. Jack Max 13 asks, can average grades be covered up by captivating essays for MIT? So here I don't really like the word covering up because it implies that you're trying to hide something. And I think the essay should be used to enhance your story and to paint a bigger picture. So for someone that doesn't have as good of grades or good SAT scores, a good way to frame your essay is to explain why that is the way it is or why you had to shift your focuses elsewhere. A lot of people had to, for example, pick up another job to support their family or had to focus a lot on sports to get to the level they needed to there and so their academics suffered a little bit. It's just really painting the broader picture so that people can understand what happened there. My SAT scores weren't, you know, in the 99th or 100th percentile, but my application reader understands that I was a three sport varsity athlete, so a lot of my day goes to sports and a lot of my nights just go to recovering from those sports events. Chill Egg asks, I want to go to MIT and study AI, but I don't have any web apps deployed or projects to show. So another cool thing about MIT is that when you get into MIT, you get into the whole school as a whole. You don't have to declare computer science or declare aerospace engineering. You can actually switch as many times as you want once you actually join. So in this case, because you do want to do computer science, it doesn't mean you have to have any sort of inherent computer science experience. But if you do want to explore and deploy your own AI projects, I don't want you to shy away from that because you think it's too out there. I think right now is a perfect time to maybe spend a weekend to just dive into something simple because I think it's simpler than you might realize. A retro BH asks, when did you start your applications? So I think I officially started my applications in the summer before I needed to apply. So between my junior and senior year of high school. And this was all just framing my personal statement and trying to understand the story that I was trying to convey. And then I ended up taking standardized tests all the way through the last day that I could take it in December to meet my applications in time. So I was going through that whole process all the way up to the bell. I don't recommend that. I recommend you start the process earlier, but that's what happened to me. Neil Pierce 24 asks, is marching band good for college admission officers to look at? So for this, I think you need to understand that no one thing is good for college applications, right? You need to be able to show your passion and show that you can excel in something because that'll show the dedication, the purpose, the drive. But the actual thing that you excel in doesn't really matter. You can start a knitting company that does sales for elderly people. If you do that well, that's great. And you can talk about it. In this case, marching band is also something that other people resonate with because they understand how time consuming and how physically exhausting that can possibly be. So it might be something that is good because you committed to something and you stuck it all the way through. Sir Ard 3 n asks, apart from MIT and Stanford, would Cornell be a good option for engineering? Yes, MIT and Stanford, I understand, are name brands that everybody recognizes. But even within the US specifically, there's a lot of public schools with world-renowned engineering programs like UC Berkeley, Colorado, Boulder, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and there's a ton more. That was just to name a few. But really, don't get caught up on the name brand. Like I said earlier, find a school that has the specific program that you want to pursue, and that'll ultimately be the best thing for you in the long run. Vasquitos asks, got any SAT tips? SAT goal 1550. So the only thing that I can really say here is practice tests, practice tests, practice tests. The more that you're exposed to the actual test that you're going to need to take, the more that you'll be comfortable with the specific problem sets. You don't have to be good at grammar. You need to be good at SAT grammar. So just keep hammering those practice problems and you'll get better over time, I promise. Christopher Barsom asks, how does undergraduate school affect grad school results? So the grad school application process is actually very similar to the undergraduate application process. They look at things like your extracurriculars, your grades, and standardized test scores, depending on which field that you're going into. The big thing that I think sets it apart is that now you have a better picture of what the person is, not just what they were in high school and 
younger, you're not really doing anything. So in college, you have the chance of getting internships and getting research experience. So your letters of recommendation there will hold a lot more weight and the actual experiences that you gain will hold a lot more weight. So that is really the main thing that really differs. Now you have a resume, now you have a CV, and now you have people that you can talk to that can vouch for your work experience. This is Hamza Ali asks, tips for how to make a CV and ideal length of CV for master's application. So my main rule for a CV is that it should be able to fit on one piece of paper front and back. Everything should fit on two pages so that you don't have unnecessary experience that you're putting there and you don't have any unnecessary fluff. I also recommend to make multiple versions of your CV. I know that you might be applying to grad school, but what if you want, say, a software engineering internship down the line or want to send your CV over to industry, right? That CV is going to look different between the places that you're applying to. So just have them ready. Cardi3 asks, how did you get in stats and stuff if possible? So I'm assuming that you're talking about MIT specifically. And here we are finally getting to this part of the video where I'm going to lay down the actual numbers that I got during that time. So the first SAT score that I did get was around 1870. For me, I was honestly really devastated when I got that score because this, again, this is on a 2400 scale and this did not rank well at all for any of the universities that I was trying to reach for. So I ended up taking the SAT two more times because I didn't want it to look bad that I took it more than three times. But by the end of it, I think I improved from that 17 or from that 1870 score to around 2100, then ultimately to 2240. And then I also improved my physics score up to a perfect 800 out of 800 on the physics specific SAT exam. And then I took the ACT one time in December right before applying just to see what I would get. And I ended up doing better percentile wise than the SAT and I got a 34 out of 36. And that was the number that I ultimately sent in for my applications. For my GPA by the time I was applying to these schools, so the end of the first semester, my fourth year in high school, my GPA was 3.92. But the story that I was able to tell there was that my freshman year first semester, I wasn't that focused, so I got a B right off the bat. But after that, I made sure to get A's throughout the rest of my high school career. So ultimately that showed growth. So that's all the questions I had for this episode of Life Support. If you want to be part of future episodes, make sure to follow me on Instagram and watch out for stories where I ask you all to ask me questions. If you want personal one-on-one -on -one mentorship over the next year or so, make sure to check out Aspire Mentors down in the link in the description and apply to be a part of our first cohort. As always, stay inspired, stay positive, and I'll see you in the next one.